Hello everybody and welcome to another video. Today we're going to be talking about basic probability for IB Math SL. I will not be covering any topics for the HL exam for math, so if you have questions about them, I suggest you go find somewhere that is going to be covering them. So today I'm just going to be covering the first few uh, topics of our, I have my formula booklet right here. We're going to be covering topics SL 4.5 and SL 4.6. All right, without further ado, let's just jump right into this. So here we have the probability of event A. Event A is going to be any event that we're talking about. It doesn't have to be called A, it can be called anything. So what we're looking at here is just that the fact that A is occurring. We know that A is occurring. For example, A might be flipping a coin. There is one side of the coin is going to be heads and the other side of the coin is going to be tails. Maybe we're trying to find event A where the coin lands on heads. So that would be, that would mean that we would have event A is going to be one. The notation that we're using here is the number for the number of event A and the number for the number of events total. So what do I mean by this? Well, because the coin has two two sides, there are two total events that could occur. So that would be one over two. The notation here that we see with the P is just going to mean probability. So we're finding the probability of event A. So you might be asking yourself, does this mean that every event that we look at is going to be one over something? Not necessarily. We could be looking at a die and we could be trying to find the numbers four or above. That would mean that there are four events that we are looking at over six total events that could, hurt, could occur. This is kind of the basics that we need to have a good understanding of before we move forward into some more complicated topics. So if you have questions on this, I suggest you go text, I suggest you go ask your teacher or leave a comment down below so I can see it. <coughs> the next thing that I'd like to talk about is complementary events. So complementary events are written A prime or letter prime, and that prime is just that little apostrophe there that we use. Uh, you can see it here. Event A does not occur. If A prime is what we're looking at, this is the amount of times that event A does not occur. So what do I mean by this? Well, going back to our coin example, if we're looking for when the coin lands on heads, this would be any time the coin does not land on heads. Obviously, we know that that's just going to mean landing on tails, but if we're looking at the dice example where we have, we're looking for any number four or above, this could be any time the dice lands on one, two, or three. Make sense? Good. All right, moving forward. So when we look at the probability of event A, we, are no, we know that that's going to be one minus the probability of event A. So the probability of the complementary event of A is going to be one minus the probability of event A. So if we had one half, we know that that would be one minus PA. So the important thing to look out for here is that this is not going to be in your formula booklet. This is what's going to be in your formula booklet. So how can you use this information? Well, by just subtracting over PA, then you can have the probability of the complementary event. This is also helpful because looking at the probability of event A, we can, and adding that to the probability of event A prime, we always know that that's going to be equal to one when these are complementary events. Keep this in mind moving forward as well. You might not see very many questions about the complementary event, but it is important to keep, the thing, keep these things in mind, especially because it is written on your, on your formula book. All right, let's look at combined events. So I have drawn here our first diagram that we would be looking at if we were looking at probability. That's a Venn diagram. We've all seen a Venn diagram before, I hope. So this shouldn't be something too foreign to you. On the left here, we have event A, maybe this is four. On the right, we have event B, maybe this is three. And in the middle, we have the intersection between A and B. Maybe this is two. So what, what, what would I mean by the intersection? Well, this is when both event A and event B are occurring. So this would be when they are both occurring. Not just one or the other, they're both occurring. So if we were looking for any time 
the, that intersection occurs, we would have to look in the center of this Venn diagram or any time that these two events are intersecting with one another, so they're both occurring. The union is going to be written with this little kind of U shape. That's the easiest way to remember. Intersection is going to be that kind of upside down U, but union is going to be like a regular U for union. And this is going to be when A, B, and A intersection B occur. So that's anytime any of the events occur. So you might be thinking to yourself, okay, well, we just come up here and we see, okay, well, event A is going to occur six times and event B is going to occur five times. That just means that they're, it's going to be 11, right? No. If only. Instead, it's important that we look at the fact that we are counting that intersection twice. So if we're just counting the number of times each event occurs, we're ignoring the fact that there is a situation in which they're both already occurring. So that brings us to our next formula that's in our formula booklet, this little guy. So what this guy is going to tell us is that the, the probability of a union between A and B is going to be probability of A plus probability of B. So that would be that, that, would be that 6 plus that 5, but then you, subtract, then you subtract that intersection, minus 2, and that's going to get us 9. So again, we're subtracting that intersection because we've already counted it once. If you're just looking at a Venn diagram and you have the intelligence in your brain to only count that intersection one time, keep that in mind. Otherwise, it is a great idea to look back at the formula and use it since it is going to be right in front of you for the exam. All right, moving right along. Conditional property again. So now we're looking at conditional property and I have drawn on here a tree diagram, which is another type of diagram you could see on the exam. So for this example, I just gave us a random example where I said we are flipping a coin to look at heads and tails. And then we're also spinning a spinner that has one side green and one side blue. All right. So that would be that HT and then the GB. So looking at conditional property. Given event B, so this is when we already have some knowledge of the events that are occurring or we know something about the uh, situation that we're in and we know that event B is going to be occurring, right? Great, so we're given B, so that's that second letter here. We're always going to be given that number. So the probability of the conditional of A and B is going to be the probability of the intersection between A and B divided by the probability of B, right? So we already have, we already have B, so we should be able to find the probability of B and we should be able to find that intersection. And that would give us our conditional, uh, that would give our, uh, that would give us our conditional uh, answer. In this example up here, if you wanted to find the probability of landing on heads and getting green, you would search, you would go through, heads, then you would go through green, right? Makes sense. And what the formula that we're going to use that's in our book here is this intersection for this intersection formula. Because these events are independent from one another and we're looking at both of them occurring at the same time, we're going to be multiplying them. So that would be H G in this situation. Usually you would be given numbers whenever possible. Try and keep them in their original fraction form just for simplicity. Your, uh, the person who's grading your exam is going to know what to look for if you keep it like that. It'll just be much simpler. All right. Last thing I have going for us here is combined events again. So the first term that I'd like to define here is mutually exclusive. I have a Venn diagram drawn here with two mutually exclusive events. This is when there is no intersection, so we can see that they don't cross over at any point. This means that the intersection between A and B here is going to be zero. And then looking at the formula that we're given on our formula booklet, we can see that the union between A and B is just going to be, this union is going to be PA plus PB, or the probability of event A plus the probability of event B. This again makes sense because we're leaving out that P that intersection, because that intersection would just be zero anyways, so it's not important. All right, finally, let's look at dependent and independent events. 
A dependent event is when one impacts the other. So this is going to be if we have conditional events and we're looking at um, perhaps we don't put a card back in the deck or perhaps our dice is loaded and we know that, well, no, that wouldn't make sense. Sorry, not the loaded dice one. We just, let's pretend we don't, we pick out a card and then we don't put it back. That would change the number of cards that we have. That would change the number of chances that we have to get that color card, that like number card, et cetera, et cetera. But independent events have no impact on one another. So back on the slide previously, when we were looking at this formula, this is going to be for independent events, right? These two independent events are occurring and that's why we have that. All right, that is going to be it today, everyone. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you learned something. I hope something makes a little bit more sense and uh, leave me a comment if you have any questions. All right, bye.